Uh, enough of that, okay? Here's the deal. We're going to talk about waiting today, all right? We're going to talk about waiting. And so here's the deal. Sometimes when you come in and you're like, man, that sermon was for me, I got a feeling that there's a lot of you going to say that today. Because here's the deal. We've been going through the story, the love story of Isaac and Rebecca. I thought it'd be two weeks. I'm going to be honest with you. I thought we'd get through it pretty quick. We crept through it now. This is week five of the love story of this beautiful couple. And here's what's interesting. The first 60 some odd verses are about Rebecca's journey because sometimes in faith you are the one that is called to step out courageously. And man, Rebecca does that amazingly. But then there's a second side to this story, and that's Isaac. And Isaac's side of the story is to wait. I loved over here getting to worship because I looked over at two sets of friends, Peter and Alana, and then over here at Kristen and Jesse. You guys have gotten to experience great victory because you waited uh, and the Lord took care of you in powerful ways. You guys are a perfect example of what we're going to study about today. And I know that there are many of you in this room, you are waiting for your miracle right now. This is a great lesson to take notes on. As much as you have the story of Rebecca and stepping out in courage and stepping out in faith, you also have the side of Isaac where you were called to wait. And we're going to read today, Watch the Horizon for God's Blessing. Great sermon to take notes on. It starts off with this question. Have you ever had to wait for something that you were unsure would ever come? Okay, have you ever had to wait for something you were unsure would ever come? I can tell you in my own life, I wrote down just a list of a few things. Waiting for a spouse, for that forever partnership that God would give us, uh, that God would give to me. Um, and waiting for a good job. Sometimes you just feel like that'll never come, don't you? You pray for it, you beg God for it. Uh, sometimes, some of you in this boat, sometimes you just want a job. You know what I mean? Uh, not just the job, but you want a job. Sometimes it's healing that you pray for yourself or for somebody else. Sometimes it's closure um, on some things that have to do with the town you grew up in, the household you grew up in. And then there's some of you praying through fertility issues right now, You're begging God for him to bless you with a child. If you are in a season of waiting, this is a wonderful message again for you to take notes on and to follow uh, what Isaac has to, uh, what the, the path that Isaac lays out for us. Are you ready? If you got your Bibles, open to Psalm chapter 40, Psalm chapter 40, and then Genesis 24. Uh, we'll, we'll start in verse uh, 62 and continue in our study there. But David lets us know uh, kind of his version of waiting uh, and how he feels through the process in Psalm chapter 40, verses 1 through 3. And I think it sets the tone perfectly uh, for what we're about to study today. Psalm 40, verse 1, some of my favorite verses in all of Scripture. David says, I waited patiently for the Lord. He, he turned to me and he heard my cry. Look at this. He lifted me up out of the slimy pit. I know on the slimy pit, some of your translations will say miry bog. It's one of the only places in scripture that those words are used. This idea that you're in a pit that you cannot get out of on your own. That as you try to climb out of it, you just slide further and further into the mess. Look at verse two. He lifted me up out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and the mire. He set my feet on a rock, gave me a firm place to stand. Now look at this. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Underline a hymn of praise. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Now stop right there for just a minute. I love this passage because it starts off with this idea that we are stuck at the bottom of a pit that we cannot get out of on our own. That's how it feels when we have to wait for things, doesn't it? You can't do it yourself and you feel like you're at the bottom of this pit. The miry bog or the slimy pit that David's talking about, the best example I could give to you of it is like a well that's been dug down. You ever seen like a well where it's wet on the sides, but you can't quite get a foothold to climb out of it if you get stuck in the mud at the bottom? That's what David says. I'm in this pit I can't get out of on my own. All I can do is call out for help and all I can do is wait. He says, then the Lord hears my cry and in his timing, he lifts me up, sets my feet out uh, instead of on the mud, on the rock so that I have a firm place to stand. And then I love this. He puts a new song in my mouth. He gives me a testimony and not just any testimony. It says a hymn of praise to our God. You know the difference between a new song and a hymn? The hymn is old and tried and true. He says, you didn't just put a new song in my mouth. He said, you've put a tried and true hymn for the ages because our Lord operates in eternal, in eternal ways and not just 
in, the, in moments that are fleeting. If you're taking notes, write this down. Sometimes God calls for a mound of faith through decisive action. And others he calls for a mountain of faith through watching and waiting. Let me say that again. Sometimes God calls for a mound of faith through, through decisive action. And others he calls for a mountain of faith through watching and waiting. If you are in a season where you are in a pit waiting for the Lord to show up, pick you up, and put you on solid ground so that you can have a new testimony and speak of his greatness. I want to encourage you, don't give up. Sometimes we're Rebecca, and it requires decisive action. And sometimes we just have to wait. Being stuck in a pit of waiting can sometimes feel like this. A little example, if you've been around waterfronts, you've heard this one before. It's one of my favorite examples. Do you remember ever going swimming when you were a kid? And do you remember putting the arm floaties on? You remember the arm floaties when you were a kid? Now, just for the record, they've kind of done away with those, and now you have the life vest that the kids swim with. Uh, but back in the day, life vests were for rich people. You know what I mean? And so uh, because of that, we'd go and we'd get those little plastic floaties. It cost about two bucks, and you'd put them on your arms, blow them up. But here's the problem with the floaties, okay? You had to be vigilant. You had to be watchful because if you jumped in the water like a pencil, then all of a sudden, shoo, laws of physics would shoot those arm floaties off your arms, and then all of a sudden, the kid that couldn't swim would be down in the water. Okay, now here's the deal if you're in the shallow end of the pool, losing both your arm floaties is bad, but it's not catastrophic because you can still jump on the bottom of the water and kind of propel yourself up so that you can get to the top. The thing that you don't want to happen with the arm floaties is for one of them to go off so that the other one stays on, and then here's what happens all of a sudden, that arm floaty puts your nose and mouth just below the water line, and you look like you're raising your hand to ask a question. You know what I mean? And the top of your head is still out of the water, so unless somebody's watching you really closely, you can be in real trouble. So, of course, I was a rambunctious child, and at four years old, I got my arm floaties on, swimming at a pool near my grandmother's house. There's about 50 kids splashing around in the water. And I'll never forget, I jump in the water. My mom had told me, don't jump in like a pencil. And I jump in, and for whatever reason, the right arm floaty shoots off. Left arm goes up like this, like I've got a question, and I can't touch the bottom to kick and propel myself up. And I'm like, I am in trouble. And I'm telling you, I can't do anything to save myself. I'm flopping around, but it looks like I'm just playing. My head's still above the water. It doesn't look like I'm having any problems. And I am waiting for someone to come in to pick me up and honestly to save my life. Praise God, my mother was watching closely, and she bounds into the water, pulls me up out of the water, and said, I thought I told you not to jump in like a pencil. And I was like, I didn't. You ever had that before? <laughs> there are some of you. And right now, I'm telling you, your heart's desire, the stuff that you want the Lord to provide more than anything else in the world, again, that forever friendship, that forever partnership. Let's just be honest. Some of you praying for friends in general, praying for that job, praying for closure, praying that the Lord would provide for you in fertility. If that's you, if you are sitting there with your head just below the water today, I'm going to give you a road map through what happens with Isaac and my hope is that you might receive hope again today that God is on his throne and he is working on it. Are you ready? Look with me, if you will, now. And here's our big million-dollar question. How do you wait well? That's what we're going to talk about today. How do you wait well? Now flip over. Genesis chapter 24, first book of the Bible. Genesis chapter 24, and we're going to start in verse 62. I love the first two words of this. You ready? Genesis chapter 24, verse 62. It says, now Isaac. Now circle and highlight, now Isaac. 61 verses of the faith journey of stepping out in faith for the servant and also for Rebecca. Man, you have this amazing story of Laban and the story of, uh, again, of uh, uh, Rebecca's brother Laban and then her mother and the father releasing her to go with them on this spiritual journey, this amazing moment of grace. But now we've got Isaac and he doesn't know any of that stuff that's been unfolding uh, away from his eyes. He just knows that the Lord's up to something, and he's praying that one day he will be able to find his wife. Look at verse 62. Now Isaac had come from Beer Lahai Roy, for he was living in the Negev. He went out to the field. Watch this. He went out to the field one evening 
to meditate, underlined to meditate. And as he looked up, he saw the camels approaching. Stop right there for just a minute. See the romance in this. It's just beautiful. He's there, and it says he goes out, and he's looking across the horizon. He has these hopes. He has these dreams, not just for his forever partner, but he wants the covenant that Yahweh's made with his father to also make the jump to his heart as well. It's a faith-filled spiritual journey that he's on as well. And this particular day, he goes out, and it says specifically that he meditates. You know what Meditate means in this passage, it means he is not just praying, but thoughtfully praying. He's considering the power and the majesty of Almighty God, considering the things that God has promised to his father and is considering all those things. And he looks across the horizon and as he is meditating, as he is praying, all of a sudden he sees the camels over the ridge. No clue that they are carrying the most precious gift that God will ever give him, his wife. If you're taking notes, write this down. How do you wait well? Number one, peacefully pray and watch the horizon. Peacefully pray and watch the horizon. I hope that this is an example that sticks with you. The problem with peacefully praying and watching the horizon, this idea of being prayerful and watchful, is you have to understand, especially when it comes to conversations about singleness, a lot of times the conversations I have about singleness have this aspect to it. Instead of being watchful, which is right here in the middle of the channel, instead, when you go through times of frustration or times of waiting, you can find yourself going to the extreme. Extreme number one, when you have a heart's desire where God has called you to wait, is you can fall into obsession, okay? Obsession is not good. Obsession is where it's all you think about. It's all consuming. Again, with the dating example, I mean, you are on every dating app, right? Every interaction you have with people is one that you're hoping is leading towards one that's a relationship angle. Every time you go out, everywhere you go, I mean, it is just a single focus. Here's the deal. Obsession is not being watchful. Obsession is distrust of Almighty God. At the same time, the other extreme is neglectful. You've got obsession on one side, watchful in the middle, and then you've got neglectful on the far side. That's the conversation on dating when you show up and you go, Pastor, here's the deal. I just need to be married to my job for a while. I got bad news for you. We are all married to work out here. You know what I mean? It's a mark of the city, all right? Now listen to me. Throwing yourself into work is not a faith-filled move either. We're called to be watchful. What does Isaac do? Isaac goes... And he meditates, watches the horizon, and he watches for the hand of God to move. Not obsession and not neglectful. Best example I can give you of being watchful instead of obsessing or neglectful is boiling a pot of water. You ever boiled a pot of water before? When you boil a pot of water, you need to be watchful. Some bad stuff that could happen there, but you don't need to obsess about it. You ever had the situation where you just go, you know what, I'm going to boil a pot of water. I'll just turn on a live flame in my house and you know what, uh, I'll check on it in an hour or so. Okay, that is neglectful. And if you live in a building, the people in your building will hate you, all right, because you're going to burn it to the ground, okay? So again, you are watchful, okay? You are not neglectful. But on the opposite side, if you are so worried that the water is going to burn the place down, you ever heard the saying, a watch pot never boils? Okay, it eventually does boil, but you don't sit there and you don't just go, all right, I just turned the burner on. Let's see what happens. You know what I mean? If you obsess over it, then you're going to end up wasting a whole lot of stinking time. So what do we do? Prayerful and watchful. One of my favorite movies is Rudy. You ever seen Rudy before? Okay, what is Rudy's hope? What does he want more than anything in the world? Play football for Notre Dame. I mean, man, he was aiming low. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. All right, there it is. <laughs> Okay. Now, here's the deal. Rudy wants to play football for Notre Dame. First in his family's history to go to college, right? For this dream to happen, there's a lot of cool stuff that has to fall in line for it to happen. And do you remember? He goes to Holy Cross, the junior college. He's working. And I love the scenes. They fast forward through it where he's still training. He's still working, but he's trying to get into the school. And do you remember? Every semester, he watchfully shows up, goes to the 
the mailbox, pulls out the letter, and tries to figure out if the admissions office lets him in. Do you remember? Time after time, he goes and he prays over it. They even show him lighting candles. They show him holding his hands, praying. Sean Austin does a great job with that. And here's the deal. He works at it. But it's not so obsessive that he is waiting by the mailbox every moment of every day to get that admissions letter. No, when the moment is powerful, when the moment is big, that's where he takes the admissions letter, usually finds a place to sit down, and he reads it. Do you remember the final scene when he finally receives the blessing and gets into the school? He goes up, grabs the admissions letter, tosses it into his book, and then he goes and sits by that beautiful, picturesque river with the leaves changing color behind him. He sits down, cuts open the letter, reads it out loud, and I love Sean Austin's line that he does. He goes, oh, thank God. Do you remember? Oh, thank God. The Lord provides in his time. Don't obsess. You're not doing anybody any favors, and you're not more spiritual because you obsess. In fact, look at my eyes. If you obsess, you have not truly given it to God. Do you hear me? For someone to obsess does not mean you're more spiritual. It means that even though you've said it belongs to the Lord, you are still holding on to it yourself. But don't be neglectful. Eh, it'll work out. It's just going to fall into my lap. It's just going to happen this way. No, that's not biblical either. We watch the horizon. We watch for God's hand and for his blessing that we might give him glory on the day of victory. If you're taking notes, write this down. Are you ready? Not every prayer has to be a whale, and not every check-in has to be dramatic. Let me say that again. Not every prayer has to be a whale, and not every check-in has to be dramatic. Now, just for the record, to wail in prayer is fine. But if every prayer you pray is a wail to Almighty God, you might not be praying very often. You know why? Because if you wailed every time you called out to God, then you would die of a stroke or a heart attack, all right? It causes your blood pressure to go so high, no one can exist in that all the time. The way to do where you're not neglectful, not obsessing, but watchful is where you sit there and you go, Lord, I wailed to you last week, and I trust that you are on it. Give me that peace that passes all understanding. Give me the joy in the midst of the storm, and I am trusting that I gave it to you, and you are working on it for my good and for the good of those around me as well. You've got to trust him with that thing. Not every moment has to be dramatic. And if it is, it might be a sign that you're not praying often enough. Trust God. Give it to him. So this building, when you look around, it took more than a million dollars for us to do the renovation on the inside. We thought it was going to be a whole lot less. And then every single one of these pillars that you see around you, they go down 55 to 77 feet deep so that we are deeper than the parking garage on the two sides of this building. I mean, this foundation is set, but it was a lot more expensive than we anticipated. Not only that, there are three beams that go right over there. If y'all are sitting on this side, you're in like the most secure place in the whole Navy Yard, all right? Okay, we got those three beams that are right there. I mean, half the building could fall down next to you and you guys would still be okay, all right? Not only that, every beam that we have going across on this side, they reinforced with eight pieces of solid steel with each beam. There's eight pieces of steel strategically put in uh, that make that roof not just secure, but I mean super duper secure, all right, for that thing to be set. Don't miss this. About half of the money in the project was recruited from waterfront people, and guys, we are very, very grateful. But the other half of the project were grants that my wife and I put together that we wrote. They were people from Texas, Louisiana, Arkansas, Mississippi, Virginia, some even from Connecticut, that gave money on the outside so that we could pay off the project and not have to take out any loans. You know what was terrifying? We were in the middle of a building project, and they were creeping up every month about a half a percentage point in interest. So that meant if we were going to take out a loan, it meant that it was going to be sky high compared to what we had thought it would be in the beginning. Instead, I'd go to the mailbox, Southwest Station, every single day, and I would pray the same prayer every time before I would turn the key there at the mailbox. Lord Jesus, please provide. Lord Jesus, please provide. It didn't just come in one big check. It came in like a hundred little checks. And all of a sudden, the Lord paid for it. And praise God, we could pay for this thing with cash and have zero payment so that this thing is done and ready to rock. 
in your walk with God, he didn't just use one person to bless us. He blessed a hundred people in the process so that this thing could come together and God could get the glory. It begs the question, have you truly given your request to God? Have you truly given your request to God? Or have you said you gave it to God and you're actually holding on to it and worrying about it, obsessing over it, or you're neglecting it? Now look at what happens next. Genesis 24, and now let's read verses 64 through 66. So again, this is so cool. He's there meditating, thoughtfully praying, and as he looked up, he saw the camels approaching. No clue the cargo that they have. Verse 64, it says, Rebekah also looked up and saw Isaac. Here's that picture of seeing a stranger across a crowded room, except it's a big open field. All right, there it is, right? So Rebecca also looked up, saw Isaac. She got down from her camel. Look at this. She got down from her camel, and she asked her servant, who's that man? All right? <laughs> she probably didn't say it like that. Who's that man in the fields coming to meet us? You can almost read the smirk on the servant's face. Look at this. That's my master, the servant answered. And so she took her veil, and she covered her face. He made her blush. What a beautiful picture there, too. This promise of God, this moment, and she sees him working in the field. Ah, it gives me chills talking about it. Don't miss this. How did we meet Rebecca at the beginning of the chapter? Working, taking care of the camels. How do we meet Isaac? Meditating in the field, keeping watch while the servant is out. He also is working. Deep calls to deep on this one. And Rebecca goes, who is that man on the horizon? And the servant smirks and says, that's your husband. That's the one that God has given to you. Oh, it gives me chills talking about it. It's just beautiful. Look at verse 66. It says, then the servant told Isaac all that he had done. I love that she takes the veil and covers up her face. It's a beautiful picture. She's blushing. She covers up her face in preparation for her wedding day that she doesn't know when that's going to be. She just knows the promise of God is going to be fulfilled. And all of a sudden, in front of her, the servant says, Isaac, I've got a story for you. And all of a sudden, remember, he doesn't just share the love story. He's talking about the transferring of the covenant from Abraham and Yahweh to Isaac and Yahweh, that the blessing will rest on his family as well. If you're taking notes, write this down. How do you wait well? Number one, peacefully pray and watch the horizon. And number two, remember that there's a good story being written. Remember that there's a good story being written. We've already heard Rebecca's side of the story and what the Lord is putting together. But the attitude that Isaac has as he's waiting for this blessing, this thing that he's always wanted, not just a wife, not just a family, but the covenant of his father to fall onto him as well. As he's peacefully praying and watching the horizon, he is also cognizant that I have to live my life as one who will give an account of the way I lived on this journey. Journey, not just before Almighty God, even though that's incredibly important, but you will give an account to the other people involved in your blessing of how you behaved in the in-between process as well. Remember, there's a good story that's being written. Now, there's some of you that would say, well, Zach, I've been through this. I waited, and I did not get what I prayed for. I did not receive the blessing. I did not receive the day of victory in the way that I had hoped. If you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. Even if our blessing doesn't come in the way we anticipate, the story of our pursuit will remain. Let me say that again. Some of you need to write that down. When your day of victory comes, or excuse me, even if our blessing doesn't come in the way we anticipate, the story of our pursuit will remain. There have been many times in my life where I have begged God and pursued things that did not come together in the way that I had hoped. But can I tell you what did come together amazingly? The journey of faith that I was on where I knew God in a way like I had never, ever dreamed of. The friendships I made along the way. The faith that God cultivated in my heart and life. Your pursuit is just as important as the end product, as the end blessing. And you're going to have to make sure that you can stand before God and those around you 
and truly be able to say, you know what? I did what I was supposed to do. I tried my very best. In Isaac's case, he was faithful. He watched the horizon and he waited for the Lord to show up. Paul writes it this way. Save your spot there in Genesis and flip to Romans chapter 14. In Romans chapter 14, starting in verse 12, here's what Paul says. Paul says, so then each of us will give an account of himself to God. Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in your brother's way. Is your side of the story when you are called to wait while someone else is stepping out in faith, while they're on their journey with God, is your story, is your side of the story an obstacle to the love story that God is writing in and through your life? Don't let it be. Trust him. Give it to him. And again, don't operate in obsession, but don't operate in neglect either. Operate in a watchful spirit, trusting that God and his timing is going to provide. And when you are found on that day of victory, you will be found faithful, not as one who was faithless, because that's a whole lot harder story to tell. You've probably heard this story before if you've been around Waterfront, but it fits for our family very, very powerfully with this. Our daughter Lulu, um, when she was five, had a seizure. And anybody who uh, has a family member or if you yourself have seizures, you know the first one's the scariest because you just don't expect it. You don't know it's coming. And so I'll never forget, um, we were uh, about to fly to California. I was going to preach at a collegiate ministry event uh, right around New Year's uh, for a group, group of uh, Ethiopian college students from USC. Uh, just a really special camp that they, uh, they do a conference uh, that, was, that USC does. And it was just a really neat opportunity. So uh, instead of taking payment, they were going to give us uh, a hotel. And we were going to take the kids to Disneyland. I'd never been before. And so we're going to take the kids to Disneyland. So I'll never forget, um, we're about to get on the plane. And Lulu, five years old, is laying next to me on the bed. And I think we were watching Princess and the Frog. You ever see Princess and the Frog? Watching Princess and the Frog together. She falls asleep. And uh, we're going to get up and go get on the plane. Well, right before, all of a sudden she throws up right there on the bed. And she gets some of it on me, but most of it is, is on her. And so it was like, oh, Lulu, oh, no. And so we try to kind of wake her up, and she just is groggy and, and out of it. We didn't know she was having the seizure at that point, but she just she was out of it. And so my wife was like, well, we got to get her into the shower and, and clean her off. So we kind of walk her up. We start to wash her off. And then all of a sudden she shoots her arms out like tree branches and has this seizure. Well, we don't know what we're seeing at first. And so we call an ambulance, the ambulance comes out. And then after she seizes, she collapses and she was unconscious for four straight hours. We didn't know if she was gonna wake up. We just begged God, wake her up, Lord, wake her up. Well, she has the seizure the day before New Year's. And so the hospital is short staffed. We're at Children's National, they do wonderful care. But uh, you probably don't want to get sick New Year's week. You know what I mean? Uh, everybody's out of town. And so um, they came in and told us, they said, with the seizure that she's had, um, they said, we can't verify with an MRI yet. They said, we don't have an anesthesiologist. They tried to have her do it. But can you imagine being five years old, being put in that MRI machine? I mean, I, it makes me nervous getting in as a, as a grown man. She just couldn't do it. She couldn't sit still. And so they said, we have to have an anesthesiologist to do this. They said, it's going to be 19 days before we can get you in to verify with the MRI. And we were like, 19 days, goodness gracious. We want to wait. We wanted it fixed now. And they said, your daughter will probably never drive a car. They said, she'll have multiple seizures moving forward from this day forward every week. And then they had told us, they said, you just need to be prepared for life to completely change at this point moving forward. And uh, I, we were broken. We just didn't know what to do. And I remember I went home. We got her set up. She didn't remember any of it. And um, I remember going home, and I told Autumn, I said, we got 19 days. Okay, again, obsession, neglect, watchful. I said, here's what we're going to do. I said, we're going to ask everybody to pray. I said, we're going to post on Facebook. I said, we're going to call all our friends and family. I said, every event that I get to speak at, including one at uh, Wayland Baptist University in Plainview, Texas, um, I got to go and speak at Wayland and do their chapel. 
their entire school, I asked them unashamedly to pray for my daughter. Uh, there was one young woman whose family had served in Germany as missionaries. She came down after the chapel, had a necklace around her neck. She took her necklace off and handed it over and said, this was from a friend of mine in Germany. They'd served as missionaries. And she said, give this to your daughter and let her know that someone she doesn't even know is praying for her. I ask everybody, because here's the deal. Whether the Lord healed her or not, I needed to know I had done everything possible so that my side of the story was I didn't leave anything on the table that my daughter, that I could stand before God knowing I had prayed with every second I had to pray. I had asked everyone else to pray. And then a miracle happened. 19 days later, we go in for the MRI. She has this and it's bathed in prayer. I mean, every inch of it. And when we go in, the doctor came in, brilliant doctor at Children's National. She came in and said, I'm so sorry you've had to wait, Mr. Randalls. And then she came through and she goes, <laughs> she goes, she had a pretty intense seizure. She said she was unconscious for four hours. I said, yes, ma'am. She goes, the MRI doesn't even show she had a seizure. We wept in the middle of the hospital room. We couldn't believe it. And can I tell you, that was seven years ago. And she has not had one single seizure in the last seven years. It's been unbelievable to watch. Now listen to me. Whether the end result is the testimony or not, the journey and the pursuit is what the person who is waiting can control. When God has called you to wait, your story of your pursuit is just as important as the way the story ends up. Amen? It begs the question, when your day of victory comes, will you be proud of your side of the story? When your day of victory comes, will you be proud of your side of the story? And then we've got one last beautiful verse. Look at Genesis 24, and let's read verse 67. I love the way this story ends. So again, servant told Isaac everything that he had done. Now watch this. It says, then Isaac brought her into the tent of his mother, Sarah. Underline brought her into the tent, and he married Rebekah. And so she became his wife, and he loved her. Underline he loved her. And look at this. And Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. Underline Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. You know what I've noticed when it comes to Almighty God? He doesn't just typically bless one thing at a time. He likes to bless a lot of things. And so much so that we feel overwhelmed by his goodness and his grace. He is completing the covenant of Abraham. But through this blessing, he's also providing Isaac a wife. And through this blessing, he's also comforting Isaac through his time of grief after losing his mother. So many amazing things that God is doing through this simple blessing. If he would just wait, God's not just up to one thing. He's up to a whole hatful of things in your life. If you're taking notes, write this down. How do you wait? Well, number one, peacefully pray and watch the horizon. Be watchful and prayerful. Number two, remember that there's a good story being written. And we want to be proud of our side of the story. And number three, keep hope that God's plan is worth the wait. Keep hope that God's plan is worth the wait. Hope is a word that gets cheapened and hijacked in political work, in the political world. I'm telling you, hope is this belief that there is still time for things to get better. When you are robbed of your hope, then you have no shot at joy. You have no shot at peace. In fact, Proverbs 13, 12 says it this way. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. You know what that means? That means if you lose hope, you get sick on the inside and it makes it difficult to even get out of stinking bed. Protect your hope. It's the wellspring of life. Man, on the inside, when we have hope, we can keep pressing on through the day because we truly trust that God is in control and he is up to good things in and around our lives. Keep hope that God's plan is worth the wait. If you're taking notes, write this down. When God's blessings seem delayed, they often fill multiple voids and bring about a sense of completion. Let me say that again. 
When God's blessings seem delayed, they often fill multiple voids and bring about a sense of completion. Keep hope that God's plan is worth the wait. Trust him. Truly give it to him. Be watchful. Stay in the middle of that channel. Don't drift into obsession. Don't drift into the hopelessness of neglect. Stay focused on God and trust that he is taking care of it. So I've been in phases before where I have literally waited for God, all right? And that was at the finest restaurant in America. Of course, I'm telling you about Red Lobster, all right? Waited tables for four and a half years at Red Lobster, truly loved it. Um, in fact, whenever we still go to eat at Red Lobster, which I still love to, we got one kind of near our, nearish our house. And every time we go in, Autumn always says the same thing. She's like, are you going to tell the waiter or waitress that you worked at Red Lobster? Okay. <laughs> To which my answer is, why do you even have to ask the question? Of course I'm going to say that every time. And you know what else? There's very few of us that are ashamed that we worked at Red Lobster. I think even Cardi B worked at Red Lobster at one point or another, right? I'm just telling you, loved it. Love Red Lobster. Except for the six months I waited tables with a degree, all right? I'm telling you. I don't know what it was. Um, Went to Oklahoma State for school, and uh, I'll never forget uh, it's just after Christmas. I'm a December graduate. It's just after Christmas. And I remember sitting down and praying through. And I remember I made a list. I was like, Lord, there's some things that I deeply desire in this life. And I'm going to be honest with you. I put on that list, I want to be married. I want to have a spouse, that forever friendship, that forever partner. I wrote down that I wanted to be a father one day. I wrote down that I wanted to be a pastor I wrote down that I wanted real friends. That was something I wrote on the list. I wrote down that I wanted to be a part of a church that I loved. Um, Just all these little heart's desires. And I remember praying, God, how do I get there? How do I get these blessings? How do I get to this point? And I'll never forget, as clear as day, oh, one of the things on the list was my father's respect. That was another thing I wrote on the list. I remember, as clear as day, the Spirit said, move to Lubbock. Now, just for the record, Lubbock's my hometown. You know where it's the most humiliating to wait tables with a degree? In front of all your high school friends. It was like, Lord, you want me to go? Okay, I'm asking you for all these things. I'm begging you for this. I'll tell you, I'll I'll go to the ends of the earth, and you're telling me to go to my hometown? You know what I mean? And wait tables with a degree? Can I tell you what happens when you wait tables with a degree in a town like Lubbock, where Texas Tech University is, when you graduated from Oklahoma State University? Here's what they say to you. They go, hey, man, we thought you were at OSU. And I go, yeah, I just graduated. And they're like, oh, so that's what a degree from Oklahoma is worth? I mean, that's what you get, right? And it was an insult on two different levels. First of all, I went to Oklahoma State and not Oklahoma. You know what I mean? And second of all, I had a good education. Moving on. It was frustrating, but I felt like I was supposed to do it, and you just meditated and looked at their eyes in every single day. I lived sleeping on my grandparents' couch for that first month that I was there, but can I tell you what happened in Lubbock? I found a wonderful church, First Baptist Church in Lubbock, Texas. My dad preached a deal called Paradigm every Thursday night there. I got my father's respect by the end of it. I got to go to a church that I loved. Back in those days, I led a Bible study, didn't get paid, but led a Bible study, and I set up the chairs on Thursday nights for Paradigm. They called me the chairman of the chairs. (laughs) Staff will still tell you to this day, I have a love affair with chairs. You know why? Because people sit in the chairs, symbolic of a heart that the Lord could touch. He stirred that within me because of what happened during those days. And waiting tables, I made the decision that I was going to do my best to grow where I was planted And if I wanted to be called to ministry, then why didn't I start witnessing while I was waiting on the tables in a tasteful way? But why didn't I start witnessing? We saw people in the kitchen get saved. We saw wait staff at Red Lobster during that time that surrendered to ministry that are still in ministry to this day. And then I started witnessing to the tables I was at. One of them was a couple in their late 60s. I walk up to the table, shared my faith, and I'll never forget, the older man looks at me and he goes, young man, he goes, "Uh, we appreciate your words, but we're already saved. I said, okay. (laughs) He said, tell us your story. I start telling him a little bit. He said, so you want to be a pastor? I said, yeah. I said, that's really what I would desire. He said, well, I'll tell you what, 
He said, our youth minister just quit. He said, I'm on the search committee for First Baptist Church Post, Texas. Post was about 45 minutes away from Lubbock. And C.W. Post, who founded Post Toasties, that's the town that he founded. All that to say, he said, we need a youth minister. Would you be interested in turning in your resume? I said, that'd be awesome. Waiting tables was how the Lord brought that about. Now, you can't make this stuff up. He looks at me and he says, so what's your name, young man? I said, my name is Zach Randalls. And he goes, you're a Randalls. He smirks. He looks at his wife. He said, my name's Mickey McMeans. He said, this is my wife, Shirley McMeans. He said, I'm the superintendent of schools for the post area. But he said, you know my son. He said, your dad, two of the churches that he pastored. My dad pastored four churches his entire career. One was Indiana Avenue Baptist Church in Lubbock, Texas. And one was Oak Street Baptist Church in Graham, Texas. Guess who the pastor was to follow my dad at two of the four churches? Steve McMeans, their son. He looks over and says, your family knows my son very, very well. He said, I think the Lord might just be in it. And the rest is history. Your first ministry job is by far the hardest because somebody's got to take a chance on you. And if I hadn't waited tables at Red Lobster with a degree, I never would have got a shot. Now, I tell you that to say this. Keep hope alive. Trust the Lord. And you guard your hope viciously. Because if the enemy can take your hope, he can make you sick to your stomach, and then every day is wretched. Trust him. It begs the question, have you let the enemy rob you of your hope? Have you let the enemy rob you of your hope? If that's you, take it stinking back. Amen? Take it back, and then you protect it viciously. Hope seems like a small thing. Paul counts it in the big three, faith, hope, and love. You realize that, don't you? He says the greatest of these is love, but hope's in that big three. You protect faith, you protect hope like crazy, and then if God ever gives you a moment where you truly experience real, honest, God-centered love, then you cling to it and you protect it with all you got. Some of you let the enemy steal your hope. Take it back. Is that a good word? If you're waiting on something today, trust the Lord. He is hard at work. Stay watchful, not obsessive or neglectful, and your blessing is coming. Let's bow our heads for prayer.